coming up on the Jerry Anderson podcast. We pay a visit to Shed 11. Funko Pops are go. I read the archives for a classic interview. My much requested shower scene. Um, and the voice of the Potsterons. All coming up in Pod 56 of the Jerry Anderson podcast. Let's get started. Let's go. Spectrum is green. The Jerry Anderson Podcast with Jamie Anderson and Richard James. <laughs> well... Pod 56. Welcome, welcome along. Yes, yes. Pod, pod 56 of what, Richard? Of the Jerry Anderson podcast, Jamie. I suppose they just said that in the, in the opening titles. They did, yeah. in the very exciting opening titles. I do yeah. feel a sense of responsibility that we have to follow that every week now. <laughs> <laughs> what, with a podcast or trying to keep up the keep up, Yeah, exactly, the energy, oh. that's right. Well, in that case, uh, we're honoured to be joined today by you. Richard James. And you. Jamie Anderson. Your yeah. hosts of the Jerry Anderson podcast. Uh, if you don't know that by now, then uh, you haven't been paying attention or it's your first time, in which case, yes. welcome along. Yes, I like the way you switch there. If you don't that by now, know that by now, then it's probably your first time, in which case, welcome <laughs> along. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, see, we can't a- alienate our, our newer listeners, can we? No, no, and there are lots of them coming. I, the numbers are up every week. Yeah. It's, it's amazing. And yeah. loads and loads of you are here because of the Royal Albert Hall. Cool. Um, so if you don't know about that, go back and listen to last week's. But yeah. we put up a video on the YouTube channel of uh, the Thunderbirds March being played live uh, in our honour, Richard, really. Yes. Uh, at the Royal Albert Hall. And <laughs> um, and that, that brought in over a thousand listeners. When we Lovely. Can you believe it? Crikey. But that's probably so, like one in five of, uh, of the whole of the Royal Albert Hall audience, I would think, isn't it? Probably, yeah. Yeah, that's amazing. So Great. welcome along. Thanks for joining yeah. us. Now, what yeah. happens, Richard? What's, what, what is this all about? Well, over the next hour or so, we've got all the usual, plus uh, some new stuff as well. We've got uh, the Quick Fire Five, of course, which is going down uh, Great Guns and is very popular. We've got some messages from our Facebook group. We've got the uh, the voice of the Podstrons. That's listeners' emails. I'll be reading out some tweets. Most importantly, though, we've got the randomizer from Chris Dale a little later on, whereby he sits down in front of a random episode from a Jerry Anderson series and gives us his thoughts and comments. Uh, and of course, we've got an amazing interview or feature this week, Jamie. Who are you uh, talking to this week? Well, um, yes, uh, this week, actually, at the point of recording, yeah. we don't know. Oh. But I'm going to fix it in post. So All right. this week, uh, our archive feature is with... Mike Trim. Uh, How exciting. Uh, I've yeah. always wanted to hear what... Mike Trim. ...had to say for themselves. Yeah. Well, it's a really interesting archive interview with... Mike Trim. Uh, so I'm sure our listeners will be very happy to hear from... Mike Trim. Great. And that's coming later up in the show. Uh, that's lovely. Marvellous. <laughs> yeah. I'm so badly organised, aren't I? It's just <laughs> you been a busy week. Plate. It's, it's been right. a really busy week and I've been away, yes, so exactly. uh, yeah, we're a bit behind. Uh, and yeah. of course, Richard, you've neglected to mention, as usual, Fab mm. Facts, which is coming oh. up any moment now, ah. uh, where I flick through a book, unless you've got your copy of Fab Facts to hand. Uh, again, I could go and get it if you don't have yours. No, I've got mine here. Don't worry. Oh, all right, don't yes. worry. Yeah, so, uh, yes, yeah. yeah, so I shall be flicking through that book shortly and we'll be well, telling you exciting. a random fact from the Jerry mm. Anderson universe. Yeah. So in the meantime, don't forget you can subscribe to us on whichever platform you're listening to us on to make sure you don't miss a single episode. Uh, you can rate us there as well, leave a nice review and share us with your friends. Uh, and you can hashtag us on Twitter as well, Jerry Anderson Podcast, so that you see your tweets and uh, we might even read them out a bit later on. I hope we do. Was that a yeah. toot there, I heard? It was a little toot. Perfectly timed, wasn't it? <laughs> it, was, uh, <laughs> it wasn't I, me, I hasten to add. It was a car. No, I hope that comes through on the recording. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> anyway, Richard, before any other weird sounds happen, should we yeah. just go straight into... Yeah. You know, one of the top oh. features of the, the, the podcast. Uh, go on, yes. Uh, go on. I can see you get so excited, don't I you? I love it. Uh, come yeah. on, then. So here it is, this week's yeah. Fab Facts. Yeah, here they come. Uh, there's the That's music. Yeah. Uh, they were very grateful for their biscuits and squash last week, Richard. Um, yeah, some of them have got to watch their waistlines, to be <laughs> I mean, honest. If anybody knew is listening, they'll be thinking, cool. who's they? It's the band that's playing the music in the background. Uh, yes, um, yes, yes. Anyway, for those who don't know, Fab Facts is, oh, we've got a book of Fab Facts, a book yeah. written by Simon Archer many years ago. Sadly, Simon's no longer with us, but uh, the popularity of this segment has meant that his book 
which hasn't been out of print for about 15 years, <laughs> yeah. has topped several of the Amazon book charts yeah, because of you lovely podstrons going by and copy. It's a great That's book. Great. But I flicked through Richard Shout's fab. We pick a fact from uh, the page that we land on and mm. uh, we chat about it for a little bit. Yeah. So, Richard, are you ready? Born ready. Then here we go. Fab! Excellent. Uh, Richard, uh-huh. you have landed on the spread of page 36 and 37 for those of you Ooh. playing along at home. Great, I do like a nice now, spread. <laughs> do you remember last week we talked about Puppet Sweat? We did, at great length. Yeah, we did. <laughs> and you also said, I wonder how they do Puppet Tears. <gasps> now, I this is not the fact this week, but I'm going to just... It, this is a confirmatory follow-up fact. I like it. Which is... What did you say they used? Did you, did you think they used? Glycerin, I was suggesting. Well, the confirmatory fact from last week's Fab Facts is glycerin was carefully dropped on the cheeks of the puppets' faces to simulate tears. Well done, I, Richard. I love this new feature, confirmatory facts. I like well, it. Well, it's a subsection of Fab Facts, so we yeah, don't want to put okay. a new feature. Okay. But, okay. No, that right. was just but it, amazing. That's an addendum, that, yes. That, an addendum, yeah. ad- addendum fact uh, from last week. And if you missed that, then go back and listen or watch on the YouTube channel. But yeah. the actual Fab Fact for this week is oh, yes. just beneath that. Right. So in the early 90s, there were lots of, um, of adverts based around Thunderbirds, Captain Scarlet, Stingray, because they were being shown on BBC Two. They were very popular. So there was a Weetabix ad using um, Stingray characters. Oh, yes. I think Titan took delivery of some toys that were free with Weetabix. Uh-huh. Um, there was a Pizza Hut advert featuring Captain Scarlet. Oh, yeah. They all weirdly said, hit the hut and pointed uh-huh. in an awkward way. Uh-huh. Um, there was a Thunderbird Swinton advert. Anyway, so there was a lot, a lot of recreation going on at the time. Yeah. So here is the fact that ties in with that. About time. Much of the 1990s reconstruction work of the Super, Super Marination puppets took place in a small shed nestling in the shadow of the 007 stage at Pinewood Studios in Buckinghamshire. Ah. Now, I have mentioned this before. Yes. It was called Shed 11. Mm-hmm. Sadly, no longer there, but it was right next to the giant Bond stage. I mean, I don't yeah. know how many Bond stages ago that was because of the fires and yeah. various things there. Yeah. But this huge epic thing with 007 on the front and down, yeah, nestled, like I said, in its shadow was this little <laughs> rickety old single-storey wooden shed. Yeah, great. And when I say shed, it was probably, oh, I don't know, four metres wide and about 25 metres long. Right, yes. And in there would be uh, Christine Glanville, um, Richard Gregory, uh, Mark Harris. Yeah. Uh, you know, a, a, a whole bunch of experts uh, who are either very sadly no longer with us yeah. uh, or are doing amazing things. You know, uh, Mark Harris has been art director on a load of the Star Wars things and Dumbo that's been out recently. And, you know, they've oh. gone on to do amazing things. And in th- there they were, camped out, making the most amazing recreations. Incredible. There was a, there was a, a recreation of the Thunderbird 1 launch bay that I remember Richard working on. Um, Christine did a, the most beautiful Scott Tracy and, a, and a, an, a, an amazing Titan from Stingray. Uh, and Mark Harris was there making a Tracy Island, full scale Tracy Island build from Paul cool. Styron using a hot wire. Um, right. And it was just, it was like a, a treasure trove of amazing yeah. stuff going on. And that, yeah. that was where I kind of really got into and got excited by uh, the industry and seeing people make stuff. It wasn't, yes. wasn't necessarily about the recreations, but the work no, they no. were doing there was. It was brilliant. It was like a miniaturised version of the old Century 21 um, workshop. Yes. Great. In such humble surroundings as well. I love that juxtaposition of this. Imagine saying, yes, of course, I'm working at Pinewood Studios, uh, pointing just over there. Well, oh, what, the 007 stage? Uh, no, no, just just beneath the 007 stage. Yeah, it's yeah. a little shed. That's, that's where I'm working. Yeah, if you, if you look at that. the 007 stage and then just to the right, and, yeah, and exactly. it was a rubbish little shed. The wind blew through it. It was dusty. It creaked in the wind. But so, amazing and, and of stuff course, happening. Yeah, and all this stuff had to be reproduced and recreated, of course, because I suppose the original props and models just weren't around 30 years later. Yeah, they either weren't around, they were in private collection, they'd been yeah, destroyed, right. or they weren't, they weren't up to scratch. And they were yeah. making some uh, amendments like uh, radio-controlled face uh, facial yeah. stuff, like mouth movement and eyes left and right for the puppets, yeah. that kind of thing that Richard was yeah. spearheading. But yeah, an amazing time, amazing place to be around. And actually, there's loads of photos from that shed in the Fab Facts book. So if you've got a copy, have a look. Great. And that, Richard, is the very end of this week's Shared Shared Facts. Amazing. Now, listeners, I'm going to let you on a little secret there. Normally, 
<laughs> normally we say something different and then we have to decide on an answer. And that is, I think, the first week yes. that we've done it the first time just through psychic ability alone. Yes, that's right. Now, you mentioned the uh, uh, a Pizza Hut commercial, I think you mentioned there, because, of course, uh, someone else has done a Pizza Hut commercial at about the same time, early 90s. Really? Uh, for a toy giveaway. Yes, it was a Star Trek Next Generation tie-in with Pizza Hut, and yours truly got to play a Klingon. Really? Yes. And I think I had to go to Pinewood for the uh, for the, the makeup, um, you oh. know, the, the live cast. Yeah. Yeah. There you go. True story. A very prosthetic period of that for you, wasn't it? Uh, it certainly was, yes. It was, yes. Eventually I got to show my real face and then I stopped working. <laughs> anyway, there we are. Let's move on. Uh- <laughs> Right, it's uh, time for quick five five, Jamie. Here are your five for this week. So, oh, Moon no. or Mars? Mars. Slough or Bray? Slough. Captain Black or The Hood? Uh, Captain Black. Joe 90's Ada Harris or The Secret Service's Mrs. Appleby? Mrs. Appleby every time. Gabriel or Bessie? Uh, Gabriel, sorry. Ah, really? Yeah, I do wonder if, they, if, if that was... Um, because it was all happening around the same time. Right. right? Uh, well, in fact, 1969 for Gabriel. So, yes. really, one could say that it came, Doctor it was Who the took its lead yeah, from yeah. The, the, the antecedent. <laughs> yeah. hmm. oh, anyway, I do hate those quick fire fives. I know. I'm very tense. Sorry about that. You did very well. <laughs> well, by, by saying one of the things that you said after <laughs> exactly. you said it. Yeah, thank That's you. That's right. Yeah, pretty much, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Any, any emails or tweets, Richard, which you would like to share with us from the Jerry Anderson Universe, or are we doing that later? Um, let's head to our Facebook page, shall we? Okay, let's do that. Where is that? Where can people find it if they're not already a member? <laughs> right, so you can join in all the fun on our Podstron's Facebook group. Uh, you can just head to facebook.com forward slash groups forward slash Podstron's where people are posting pictures and competitions of their own. Rob Doyle, for example. Now, he says, I'm listening to my big finish purchases in release order and just finished The Waters of Amsterdam, a direct sequel to the Doctor Who story Arc of Infinity. And as I listened to a character who sounds a bit like Richard James, I noticed that it's only directed by Jamie Anderson... And there's a young star in it as well. There is. Mm. There's also a, um, a, a Scarlet Captain. There, there is indeed. Yes, yeah. that's right. There's you, Robbie Stevens, Wayne yeah. Forrester, and me, all yeah. in, not all in, but all uh, working on. That's all right. Adopted. That's right. That was indeed. Great fun, wasn't it? Uh, so, I mean, that leads me to ask are there any more, do you think, uh, room for any more Jerry Anderson properties being released from, from Big Finish? I don't see why not. I don't think mm-hmm. there is anything in the pipeline right now, but um, I, I'd love to see more in the future. Yeah. The problem is, Richard, we're all just so busy. Yes, I know. Uh, and it's uh, you know it's it's hugely time consuming to, to to kind of reimagine something for audio. Yes, uh, but absolutely. Uh, if there's any news in that area, we'll be sure to let you know very soon indeed. Uh, Joe Hollies wrote, uh, would anyone like to have seen new Captain Scarlet developed into a full series as a sequel to the original series rather than a remake? Which he says I liked anyway. Uh, would that have worked, do you think? Or uh, was that ever mooted that it might be a, a sequel? Well, it was It was originally going to be called Captain Scarlet and the Return of the uh-huh. Mysteries. So yes. I suppose in a way it was originally talked about as being a sequel, but then you've got to do the setup of the whole kind of Retro metabolism, uh, yeah. retro metabolism, and Scarlet's uh, indestructibility and all that kind yeah. of stuff. So you kind of had to set it up again for people that didn't know the show, and also then trying to continue something without maintaining the same look. I don't know. Yeah, yeah, sure, yeah, fair enough. And finally, uh, Mark Owen Hurst said, uh, "Thanks for another great pod, guys. My love of the shows didn't need reawakening, but the pods have galvanised me to try those that I had not previously seen, which is something we always love." Uh, he said, "I binged on Lavender Castle in a day, adoring mm. its gorgeous visuals and music, with dueling banjos being a wonderful showcase." Yes. Four Feather Falls, he says, was also a revelation when I discovered just how detailed the sets were and how ambitious the camera work in comparison to other non-Anderson shows of the period was. Thanks for the inspiration. Uh, well, that's nice, isn't it? So he's going for one of the later ones there with Lavender Castle and then going, going right back to the origins and watching uh, Four Feather Falls. In fact, two series that were released 40 years apart from ah, one another. How lovely. Amazing. Isn't that amazing? Yeah. yeah. Uh, and finally, I just have to say a personal thanks to Michael Horgan, who's posted lots of lovely pictures of our uh, oh, yes. lovely weekend in Leicester at the uh, the Fab Worlds of Anderson at the Space Centre. Yes, so, thank uh, you for that, Michael. Yeah, yeah. So head on over to our Facebook group if you want to join in the fun. Answer three questions, answer all of them, and uh, yes. I personally will let you in. Yes, and if you go to invite somebody new to the group, yeah. do tell them that they've got to answer the questions because we've yeah. got a queue of what nine or eleven people yeah, who haven't yeah. answered any questions. And no. sorry, but we just can't let you in. No, that's true enough. Exactly. Anyway, Richard, thank you for that. You're welcome. I feel like it's mm. time 
to talk about some new things oh. in a section which we could potentially call the Jerry Anderson News. Why don't we do that? Here it is. Also known as uh, Newsy News News News. Well, I yes. It's coined by you. Uh, yes. See that hashtag appear every now and again. <laughs> yeah, just occasionally. Uh, now, it's a, it's a relatively quiet week. Yeah, that's all right. We don't mind that. But the fact that this is the 56th week of us having Jerry Anderson <laughs> News at all is, a, is quite a good sign, I think. <laughs> that's very true. Yes. Um, let's start off with some Thunderbirds news. The Funko Pops are go. Oh, nice. Yeah, so uh, Brains, Penelope and Parker have been mm-hmm. given the Funko Pop treatment. They look awesome. Mm. They are now in the warehouse. They are available at the Jerry Anderson store if you've pre-ordered them. They may already be in your hands right now. If not, they'll be there mm. in a couple of days. Um, go and grab them. The price is going up from ten ninety nine, I think, to eleven ninety nine uh, right. next, next weekend or this weekend coming at the time yeah. of uh, listening, time of release. So uh, head on over, grab them when you can, and um, enjoy. And if you uh, if you've bought the Funko Pops, and you would like to uh, recreate any famous scene <laughs> from Thunderbirds with the Funko Pops, we would love to see your work. Yeah, great. Um, uh, I, I'm I'm not kind of making it an official competition of any no, sort, but no. if you want to send in your entries to podcast at jerryanderson.co.uk, yes. Um, we may pick one or two of the really good ones and then maybe send you a little something as a, as a okay. congratulations and a thank you. But Lovely. It's quite very nice. Cute. It gives you some, because they're kind of very cartoony, it gives you some scope to have some fun with them. Yeah. So, uh, yeah. yeah oh, so lovely. Look forward to seeing those. That'd be great. Some more merch news. Oh, lovely. Uh, we've had several requests. In fact, there was an email a few week, weeks ago on the podcast, I think, with somebody saying, can you put the Spectrum Roundel on some T-shirts and hoodies, please? Because I would buy that immediately. Aha. Uh-huh. Well, person who said that, yeah. you can go and buy them immediately <laughs> right now uh, because the Spectrum Roundel uh, range is out, ready to go, ready to ship. So uh, go and grab those, Captain Scarlet fans. Cool, nice. And just popping back to Thunderbirds for a moment... Our very own randomizer general in chief commander himself, mm. Chris Dale. Has he had a promotion? <laughs> yes, several. Of course he has. Since last yes. week. Yes. Uh, Chris Dale has written a lovely article for the Jerry Anderson website about his top five Thunderbirds guest villains. Right. Great. Uh, which is quite fun. Yeah. Nice way to revisit some of those uh, lesser known characters who were particularly dastardly. Yes. So pop along to the Jerry Anderson website, jerryanderson.co.uk. Uh, and watch that whenever you like. Watch it. No, don't watch it. Read, read it, it well, whenever you, you like. Read it with your eyes. <laughs> yes. I mean, it's a similar thing, isn't it? Yes. Use your eyes to translate the text to meaningful words <laughs> in your mind. Exactly. Oh, yeah. dear. It's right. much quicker to say read it, though, isn't it, really? <laughs> Just go read it. Yeah. Right. That is the end of this week's Jerry Anderson News. That was the news. That was the news. Oh, a nice little... Um, hey, what do you think? What's that called? Uh, singing. Wobble. <laughs> Wobble. Pitch bend. Oh, yeah. yeah, that'll do. Nice little yeah. pitch bend at the end. Thank there, you very much. You? Well, I try my best. Thanks for doing that. <laughs> <laughs> oh, dear, dear. Now, we, uh, we're going to be doing a survey in the next few weeks mm-hmm. uh, about uh, what merch you would like to see. Aha. Uh-huh. We're, we're talking to a few people about doing some things which may allow us to go more into the kind of toy-ish type area oh, possibly okay. a few more models uh, and there is a there's another um uh planet replicas piece which we'll be working on very shortly and there'll be news on very soon this mm-hmm. isn't quite news this is just a general discussion yeah so um yes uh, do pop your merchy merch merch thoughts yeah don't feel restricted go crazy cool well, well um, now that's put the cat among the pigeons and we'll see we'll see what we can do can't wow. make any promises yes but uh yeah, hmm. we just pop into podcast at jerryanderson.co.uk or uh, have a chat about them on the Podstron's Facebook group. Yeah, okay, nice. What sort and of thing the, do you... Yeah, what? Uh, hmm? no, Rich, I was just going to say, hmm. do you want to put a quick plug in? What, a book? Space Precinct plug? That's a good idea, isn't it? A bath plug. An Orin bath plug. An, an Orin bath plug? Yeah, why not? Grab him by the head and pull it out, let the water out. It's a great thought. It would sit very nicely alongside your Space Precinct bubble bath collection that they did back in the day, wouldn't it? I was going to say that I've got... I don't have it here. <laughs> no, uh, and, no. Uh, uh, and Richard, uh, uh, just not quite on the merchy thing, but uh, you've got a book out, I believe. Oh, right? Crumbs. Yes, still. That's right, I have. I've got two books out now. 
Yeah, but the second book's only just come out, hasn't it? That's so true, yes. Do you want to give it a, a tiny little plug? Yes, it's part two of the Bowman of the Yard series. It's called The Devil in the Dock, following the adventures and investigations of Inspector George Bowman from Scotland Yard. It's an exciting story, which continues on from the first book, but also can be read on its own. Good. But why not, why not buy the whole series? Dive in, fill your boots. Why not just write Richard a blank check and send it <laughs> to his house? Uh, the address is yeah. as follows. Yeah, uh, that would be very useful as well. Precinct 88. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Anyway, uh, thank you, Richard, for your plug. Uh, well, possibly, I know you. lots of you have bought the book and are enjoying yeah. it, so thank you to all of you who have supported dear Richard in his <laughs> literary endeavours. Thank you so much, Jamie. <laughs> Great pleasure. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Now, lots okay. of those posterons who have mm. uh, uh, bought your book have also been emailing us. Yes, they have. Now, it's a very long uh, randomizer this week and an unknown length of interview with Mike Trim. So, uh, yeah. yes, yeah. We'll, uh, we, we've only picked two emails this week. So, um, oh, and I've forgotten to do the intro thing. Well, where just we, open the we... door then and let the draft in. Uh, what, oh, the bit where it... Oh, yeah. Oh, oh you oh. see? Like that. Here we go. <laughs> Is the voice of the Podsterons. <laughs> Here we are. This is indeed the voice of the Podsterons, our lovely email uh, uh, from our listeners uh, who have been emailing us at podcast at jerryanderson.co.uk and you can do the same and we might read out yours next time. So, for example, I have one here from Simon Allen. Good. What does Simon say, Richard? Well, funny you should say that. He says, hello, Richard and Jamie. Good. I don't mind so that. So he's already gone up in my estimation. And I haven't even read the email yet. Uh, I've had to take up the electronic pen to praise your highly efficient podcast. Efficient, that's the best thing that can be said. <laughs> and it's it? not, so he's obviously good. <laughs> uh, I recently started listening to a rival podcast hosted by another double act who seem to rely on Google and their phone-a-friend lifeline. I don't know what it means. Mm. Can they mean? Uh, whilst they were reviewing Space 1999, they accused Nick Tate of having a cod Australian accent. And that Bar Barry Morse was in The Protectors, which they corrected to the zoo gang with Robert Vaughan. When they reviewed UFO, after extolling the virtues of Little Chef, they had a joke about Lieutenant Ford not being able to see England play Croatia as it was 1970 and there were aliens about. Major blunder. Croatia would have been part of Yugoslavia then. And if they meant 1980, there was no World Cup then anyway. Uh... But I mean, that's what you get for listening to rival podcasts, isn't it? Yeah. Uh, he then goes on to say, I'm sure professionals <laughs> such as yourselves would not make such clunkers. Maybe they leave Jerry Anderson Productions to yourselves. Yes, maybe they should. Uh, and that's from Simon Allen. Thanks, yeah. Simon. Yes, well, yeah. if you will go off and listen mm, to Ryan yeah. Podcast, then what do you expect? Yeah. Um, and obviously, you know, we are uh, uh, encyclopedic in our yeah. knowledge. Yes. And 100% accurate 100% of the time. <laughs> <laughs> oh, no. Asterisk, what did you say that for? We're not. Yeah, thanks. Good. Yeah, don't worry, I put the small print in. Great. That's fine. Uh, thanks for that, Simon, and thank you, Richard. Uh, I have an email from Lewis. Oh, yeah. He says, hello, gents. Ah, hello, Lewis. Uh, just checking in to say thank you for the great pictures from Fab Worlds. Oh, yeah. Sadly, I couldn't make it. Sad face emoji. Oh. Uh, but I was there in spirit, and I look forward to the next one. I also really enjoyed the video of the live, live Thunderbirds theme at the Albert Hall, which is mm. on Jerry's YouTube channel. Mm. It made me add the Thunderbirds theme to my Spotify playlist. Um, and that unfortunately led me down a rabbit hole of adding more Jerry Anderson themes uh, than TV show themes and Doctor Who theme music. But no complaints from me. Perhaps yep. from my partner, though. Uh, keep up the great work from Lewis, who's from the exotic northeast of Wales. Oh, that is quite exotic up there, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. Well known for its uh, palm trees, and yes. rainforest, uh, humidity, right. and all that sort of stuff. <laughs> yeah, and Anglesey. <laughs> I can see, uh, yes. But yeah. anyway, thanks, Lewis, for that. Uh, it's amazing how it does happen, though. You, you know, you get kind of that nostalgic time oh, yeah. from something. Yeah, absolutely. And it sends you off on a, on a trip of nostalgia going, oh, I, yeah, and I remember that. And then yeah. if you're on YouTube, then obviously YouTube will keep feeding absolutely. you. Absolutely. Stuff like that. So, and before yes. you know it, an afternoon's gone. Exactly. Yeah. So, sorry about that, Lewis. Uh, blame uh, Anthony Inglis and the uh, London Concert Orchestra. Yes, that's what it was. You're right. Yeah, great. Very nice. So don't forget, if you would like to send us an email, just send it to podcast at jerryanderson.co.uk and uh, we'll be sure to read it out next time. Uh, Richard, you know what that means? It's your turn. I've got a terrible feeling about this. I've got a good quick quite a fire for you this week. So, the Battle mm -hmm. of the X's. XL5 or Zero X? Oh, Zero X. Battle of the Hawks. Space 1999's Hawk or Terrorhawks Battlehawk. 
Crikey. Oh, Space 1999, I think, definitely. <laughs> okay. In the Battle of the Zeros, X20 or Sergeant Major Zero? Sergeant Major Zero. Officers, Castle or Took? Oh, I'd have to say Castle. And finally, interviews, new or archive? Crikey! Oh, hmm. I'm going to... Oh, it's difficult. I'm going to say new. OK. Yeah. Fine. You, I mean, you, you know, it. I love you a bit of archive, it. but I, I do love to hear people that we haven't heard before talking about stuff we haven't heard them talking about before. That is that is something we love to do on this yeah. podcast anyway, yeah. isn't it? To try and get new points of view, new perspectives, because, you know, we've heard lots and lots and lots from... Yeah, you know, from, well, from the likes of Dad and Derek Meadows and yeah. uh, and dear old Shane Rimmer and and, yeah. and those guys, and we love to hear from them still. But yes, new perspectives, yes, new bits and pieces, are great yeah. to hear. Yeah, um, absolutely. Well, now you've said that you like the new ones, um, I right. suppose we should uh, have some have, archive, have, have an archive interview, <laughs> <laughs> which I will also enjoy because of it's course. with Mike Trim, isn't it? Yeah, uh, and obviously we've all been looking forward to the interview with Mike Trim. So this is an interview from, um, uh, well, the uh, yeah. late 20th or early 21st century. <laughs> well, that's all I can say at this yeah. point. Uh, and the interview is with... Mike Trim. And of course, you'll all know... Mike Trim. Because of their role uh, doing... Things. Yes. I'll <laughs> put an insert in there, probably. Uh, so, without further uh, filler or uh, saying random things, here is the archive interview with... Mike Trim. Well, I joined the company in 1964 uh, in the pre-production period on Thunderbirds and was with them right the way through from Scala, Joe 90, Secret Service and up to the end of UFO in 1970, I think it was. I had answered an advert which my father had discovered in one of the evening papers, which simply said, um, film company requires model maker. And like many lads of my age, I was sort of an amateur model maker, gluing my plastic kits together and the like. Um, and I was a bit of a loose end and I decided to sort of contact them and go down and I took some drawings and design bits and pieces that I was fiddling around with at the time and much to my surprise they took me on um, but I didn't know until I got there really that I'd been watching their product um, which was Fireball XL5 occasionally on a Sunday afternoon I think it was so I had, that was sudden, you know, quite a surprise to me and while I was there for my interview Derek uh, very kindly took me into the uh, theatre there and showed me some of the stuff that was upcoming, which of course was Stingray, which was really quite uh, an eye-opener, being colour and more elaborate than Fireball X or 5. But uh, no, I was completely and utterly ignorant of who they were. And my function when I joined was as a model maker, but I fairly quickly chanced my arm and rather cheekily decided to get involved in the design side of it, which much to my delight Derek liked and therefore accepted. And after about a year as a model maker, I became his assistant and worked as storyboard artist, but also I was picking up more and more of the design side. And then that really became the two main strings of my employment right the way through. But I never actually got out of the habit of going down to the model shop and uh, interfering and getting in the way, really, and um, doing a little bit of that because it's it was kind of in the blood, I think, and I just felt I had to go in there and do it. What we wanted to do was to improve what we were doing. And we were always striving to try and find a new way, a better way, quicker way, more effective, whatever, to bring techniques that we were using f further and further and further towards realism. And I suppose it, it was never a stated aim. There was never sort of any a, a mission statement or anything like that that said, we must do this. But I think all of us were trying to do that in our own way. And gradually, bit by bit, over the various series that I was involved in, that Obviously, it sort of took us on quite a journey, really. Things changed, techniques developed. Well, I think, I, if I remember rightly, I was given a, an early script because obviously the scripts were circulated amongst people like Derek and the puppet directors and what have we. And I got to see a, a fairly early copy of it. And um, I'd been quite disappointed, I suppose, like a lot of people in the studio, and surprised and disappointed, I suppose, when we knew that Thunderbirds wasn't going any further because certainly I, and I think a lot of my colleagues did, felt that there was still mileage in it. We could have taken it further. We could have introduced new characters, new craft or whatever. There was still something to be done with it. But once I looked at the Scarlet script and saw where that was going and suddenly realised that we were moving on to something quite different, darker, less frivolous, I would say, which uh, 
obviously quite a lot of the Thunderbird scripts had this sort of humorous element in them. That was completely out of Scarlet. So it, the, the sort of the challenge then was to try and make the thing look as, as realistic as we could. And, um, yeah, it was quite a quite an iron opener, really. It really was a sort of step change from, from Thunderbirds in many ways. I suppose we'd had a, a slight in-between period where we'd done the, the feature film for Thunderbirds. And one of the first discoveries that we made when we shot some test footage was to go down to our local Gaumont cinema and have it projected on this enormous 40-foot screen. And we were horrified by what we saw, really. I mean, it really was dreadful. And I, rem- I was sitting virtually next to Derek, and the immediate reaction was, we've got to go bigger. So the scale of what we were doing was changed. On Thunderbirds, a lot of the cars and vehicles and street scenes and things were a 124th scale. For the th- feature film, we changed that up to 12th scale, which gave us more room. And, of course, the other change that, that came in on Scarlet really was the abandoning of any kind of staging on which to build the sets, which, of course, a lot of Thunderbirds was done that way, and moving on to the floor of the studio, which gave us far more room to operate. It did require the digging of camera pits to, to get that sort of located and out of the way, but it gave us more room, and therefore we could do shots, as we did in Thunderbirds, with the cameras literally mounted on a trolley and following a vehicle up a street. That wouldn't have been possible on the Thunderbird sets. You just didn't have the physical room to do it. It was fortunate that both Derek and I shared um, a style which was, I would have described it as near future rather than far future. So both of us sort of sat side by side um, quite happily in that respect. And it was very rare for Derek to get involved. Uh, if I'd do a design, he wouldn't... A lot of the times, he never saw the designs I did before they went over to the model shop. And fortunately, most of the time, if I did get around to showing them, he'd say, fine. And that was the end of it. There was no sort of interference or trying to change the style or anything like that. I, I don't think either of us would have been particularly good if we'd been trying to design for a series that was set in some far-flung, far future. I, I really don't think we'd have got it. But just having something that's the day after tomorrow kind of approach. I think that was where it it worked, and it worked well, I think. Captain Black was a very different figure from anybody that had come up in Thunderbirds, even the hood. I don't know how children reacted to him, but he never struck me as a particularly frightening character. But I've spoken to people in in adult years who were children when Scarlet was around, and I've heard a couple of them say that when Captain Black came on, they hid behind the settee. It was that... That sort of feeling. And it's right there from the opening sequence, that sequence in the alleyway, which again was incredibly small, thinking back. It's a tiny little alley, little set, really, that. It's so sort of evocative. It sets the style and the, and the tone for the whole thing. But yes, they, it was a very dark kind of construction, Captain Scarlet. I designed the Spectrum stuff that I designed as a maximum security vehicle, the, the patrol car, the helicopter. But one of my favourites out of that lot, I suppose, was the the poor old hovercraft, which never really got used very much. But its I don't know what it is about it, but uh, I still quite like it. The the danger with all of these things, of course, is that um, with any artist, with any designer, you should be looking back at stuff and thinking, "Mm, yeah, that, uh, that, wish I hadn't done that, wish I'd changed that. And you want to start fiddling and interfering and improving and bringing things up to date. And, of course, you look at these things now... And there is always that sort of element of judgment. That, yeah. yeah, I quite like it, but I wish I hadn't put that fin on it or whatever. But those, I suppose, are the ones that probably stand out. There were certainly designs at the time where the design you came up with was you liked, but for reasons of usually trying to match to art department puppet sets, they changed. I look at them now and I realise quite how sort of awful the change is because there's all sort of streamline and then suddenly it all goes very blunt and you're getting model makers to carve something out of a piece of balsa wood or whatever which is relatively straightforward but the poor old people building the puppet sets they're trying to wrap bits of sheet ply and perspex and things which is not very forgiving if you've got lots of compound curves and it was inevitable it was going to happen so in later life i probably tried to accommodate them from the design side so i didn't end up being disappointed but a Magnacopter from Scarlet is one of the ones that really comes to mind. I mean, it didn't have that front on it, but that front was a set that they'd had, I think, from Thunderbirds they wanted to reuse. So you suddenly, all right, OK, we'll chop the front off and put this very blunt thing on that matches. But, I mean, that was just the way it went. We spent more time, I think, on screen building drama 
if we had a, a vehicle that was going on a treacherous mountain path with precipitous drops alongside it, we would have the vehicle coming up and past, but we would also have the close-up shots of the wheels just grazing the edge and the rocks falling down, and we would build the drama. Whereas now, with digital, one of the dangers of it, I think, is it's all whiz-bang. It all happens so quick. And there's also, I think, a, a modern way of editing which shoves shots together very, very rapidly. It's, it's Nothing's on the screen for any, any length of time. It's bang, 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 which is very pacey and very exciting in some respects, but I don't think it necessarily builds the drama. And I think maybe that's what attracts people to something like Thunderbirds. It is the fact that we took the time to really build it up and show the danger. But that's, that's progress for you, isn't it? But I've worked alongside people who really were inspired by those shows. It seems rather strange to be doing that. Uh, I was just doing a job, a job I loved, a job I thoroughly enjoyed and um, was sad when, I, when it all came to an end. But at the end of the day, it was, it was just a job. And then suddenly, 50 years later, people are sort of saying, well, you know, you've inspired people. Well, gosh, have I? That's amazing. Great. You know, but I still don't quite believe it, I don't think. Um, but I don't think there was any apprehension. I mean, we just were on a tight schedule always with all these things. So you just knuckled down and got on with it and did your best to produce it all in time. I've been back to the studio. I went back in 1999 and had a look round. And one of the things that struck me immediately, I walked through the door, was how small it was. Um, and although I, obviously my memories of it didn't necessarily make it that big, standing on what was one of the stages and looking at it and thinking, good God, did we do what we did in here? Because it was, I'd, I'd got a little bit used to sort of major film studios by that time. And it just looked tiny. Um, and that always was, I suppose, one of the limitations that we operated in. Uh, there wasn't much height to the building, so backings couldn't be terribly tall. Um, it was difficult to get the lights uh, that lit the backings sort of out of shot because there wasn't enough space to take them up above the backings. It was all those sort of problems, but we worked around them. I mean, necessity is the mother of invention, as they say, and I think that was probably one of the ways we operated. We just overcame whatever problem came up in front of us. I think it was quite close in many ways. I mean, they were never exactly the same as I'd drawn because it's much easier just to whip a pencil across a piece of paper and present it to a model maker than it is for them to turn that into something in three dimensions. But one of the processes that I went through as part of my role, although it was never sort of, this is your job description, you will do this, it just evolved like so many other things there, was to go over to the model shop every day virtually and sometimes twice a day and wander around, talk to the model makers and through that process you were able to sort of steer them as well as having this visual because sometimes the visuals were not that great. There wasn't enough time to be elaborate and get your paints out and do wonderful bits of artwork. They were quite scribbly and therefore there was a lot of information that was missing so I could go over and sort of stand and chat and say well how's this going and they would say well that's a bit difficult because if I do that that's going to mean so I change it so the thing evolved in that process so quite often what ended up on the stage in front of the camera was not exactly the same for those very reasons that there were manufacturing problems that had to be overcome you couldn't grow that attached to these things um, because quite often they were meeting some dreadful dreadful end um, and even if they weren't there was never any sort of preciousness about them um, stuff was saved put them into a model store in the later days of the studio so that if you required things as background they could be hauled out and stuck in, into the front of the camera again but really it was uh, surprisingly I, I suppose we didn't we weren't that precious about the things they were for a job they did a job they went in front of the camera job done end of story on to the next one um, and I often wish in some ways that I'd have been light-fingered enough when the studio closed down to have swiped a few off the shelves and brought them home so that I had some sort of physical, you know, this is what I did. This is, But we didn't do that. And, of course, at the end of the studio, it was very sad to go back and see lots of the stuff being broken up. I saved the artwork. That was, that was the main thing that I did um, simply because... Um, it was nine times out of ten I'd go over to the model shop and I'd sort of see it dimly perceived under a layer of sawdust and other muck at the back of a desk and I'd rescue it and bring it back. It's the only way that I ended up with any stuff at all. 
It, unfortunately, I mean, it, it, I suppose in some ways you can see the advantages of CGI, but uh, for me, there's never quite anything like the real thing, um, and it is a shame. And I know when the studio was looking at moving towards live action, the puppet director Des Saunders approached me and asked me if I would join him, Keith Wilson, and I think Dave Lane as well was involved with coming up with another puppet series. And I know Des went to Jerry and said could we do this running alongside the live action because we think there's a market for this. But Jerry was so... He'd always had this ambition that he wanted to do um, live action and the puppets were only ever as a stepping stone towards that goal um, and he didn't want to know, so it never happened. But I, we did get involved in designing and you know, scripts and things for that. So um, I think it had mileage beyond where we had, where we left it anyway. So I mean, I always shudder whenever I see the lemon squeezer. There are other things in there which uh, I can sort of identify, but that one is the one that stands out above all. And I, I really don't know to this day why on earth we decided to stick that on the wall. It must have been a moment of weakness, I think. Um, so I'd certainly go back and change that if I had my time over again. At, I mean, to me, it was a looking back. I think it's it's an art which sounds rather big headed to say, but it is. It's a kind of art to be able to look at things and and see them in another life, with other bits added and making something out of nothing. And to begin with, it was really done out of necessity, I suppose, because time and money wasn't necessarily that lavish to begin with. But afterwards, it just became something where it, it was your routine way of working. You Even the models that we had created in the model shop, um, and they all were dressed with other material before they were finally presented in front of stage to put all the detail and the nonsense on, which would be difficult and complex and time-consuming for the model makers to create for themselves. But I suppose by the time Scarlet had gone on for quite a while, there was always the thing in the back of your mind that we may well go on to something new. Um, which we obviously did. But again, I, with Scarlet, I think there was possibilities of taking it further than it went. But um, I'm not quite sure where the decision was made, whether it was made by Jerry or whether it was made by Lou Grade or where it came from, but um, obviously someone thought that enough was enough and we needed to change tack. But I'm, I'm sure I'm right in saying this, although you'll correct me, I'm sure, if I'm wrong, um, the series, very, as they went on, they were never as popular as the original Thunderbirds. I mean, Scarlet wasn't, and I don't think Joe 90 was quite as popular. Whether it was a steady decline, I'm not certain. But if that was the case, then it was a shame we didn't go on longer with Scarlet rather than going on to Joe 90, which I loved as a series. I mean, I really enjoyed it, but uh, it didn't seem to sort of hit the spot in quite the same way. But we did have a lot of freedom and we didn't often get any kind of edicts passed down from on high as to what we could do or what we couldn't do. Um, I suppose to some extent, working alongside Derek, um, I got to know of some of the bits and pieces that were going on, but I'm not sure how much Derek filtered out before it sort of passed to the lower ranks, as it were. <laughs> um, but it, it, was, it worked. It was a system that worked, really. For the vast majority of people, it was a fairly consistent run. Um... And I think I think everybody really was was quite sort of proud of what they were doing and they were quite into it in the sense of, as I said earlier, wanting to improve, wanting to make better. I mean, even right at the end, in the closing days of UFO, I can remember, we were still fiddling about trying to improve the techniques and you, you look at each series and gradually there's a new technique coming in and then on the next series it's it's developed even further. You can kind of trace the, the lineage of it. Um, but that was the way we worked. I mean, we were, we wanted to make it a good, as good as we could make it. It was somewhat unbelievable, I have to say. I mean, I kept sort of pinching myself, and I've asked people the question many, many times: "What, what on earth was it?" I mean, I even, even asked Jerry once at a convention. I said, "Did you, do you know now what it, what the magic was, what the, what the secret was?" And he didn't. But it, it just sort of surprised me completely that people who, at that stage, were beginning to come sort of into the digital world suddenly were still interested in this rather strange, old-fashioned series. And it didn't, it didn't really make much sense, I must confess. And I can only believe that it is the story, the content, that was the thing that grabbed them, the, the basic idea, rather than necessarily the technique that was used to deliver it on screen. I think it's a complete world. 
it's it's presents you with a complete environment which is dark, moody. There are threats. It's aliens. Um, it's also vehicles that aren't quite like the ones that you'll see trundling past your front door. Um, there are characters that are interesting. And I think the whole mix comes together quite nicely and, and, and presents you with something that maybe is just not out there in other forms. I'm not sure. I mean, that's a rather sweeping statement, but I sometimes wonder if there are. And it's also quite... I use the word slow advisedly here, but it is. It's It sort of builds attention. It's not all whiz-bang, crash-bang, wallop. Um, and I think that does appeal to people. There is obviously an element of nostalgia. I mean, there's still maybe dads have drummed it into their kids. You must sit and watch this because this is great because I really enjoyed this when I was your age and, you know, maybe the kids have been dragooned into it. I'm not sure. But... Um, I think it is just the fact that it is different. And I think that's what was the appeal in the old days. Something, something came on the screen that just wasn't around. And now it does sort of separate itself out from a lot of what's going on at the moment. See, Richard, have you changed your mind now about Archive versus uh, New, having heard that interview with... Mike Trim. Well, do you know what? Having heard Mike Trim talk at such length, in, in such an interesting way... I've I've been swayed. You're right. Okay. Well, we won't bother with any new interviews in that case in the future. Oh. We'll just stick with uh, the archive ones. Now, how are you getting on with your uh, uh, potential chats with Ross Kemp? And, uh, you, um, well, I mean, I wish I had news to report. I know Ross has. He told me he'd be going away, so um, I'm, I'm suspecting he's somewhere dangerous at the moment. So I, I dropped a line to his um, his publicist, as he suggested. If if I don't hear back from her, I'll grab him next time I see him in the village. I mean, that's that's how it works, isn't it? You know, Perfect. If he's got a spare five minutes, he can come and. Uh... He won't mind. No, of course he won't. And um, yes, yeah, so I've also been uh, in talks with Simon McCoy. Ever heard of Simon McCoy? BBC Newsreader. <laughs> that's right. Mm. Who apparently massive Thunderbirds fan. Uh, awesome. So um, uh, we're, we're looking at a time one Friday when we can sit down together and have a, a wee a wee sherbet and uh, a bit of a drink. Fantastic! Perhaps he could record <laughs> us a special newsreader style intro for the Joe wow. Hansen podcast. Nice. Okay. Yeah. I'll if get you on could make that happen. That'd be great. Yeah. Uh, as usual, listeners, if you have a suggestion of an interviewee, someone you think we should talk to, uh, be they fan, someone involved with the shows, uh, or you know, just a, a, a stranger, really. Yeah. Uh, just some uh, random person. We will literally talk to any human who has any <laughs> knowledge of any Jerry Anderson show. Uh, so yeah. do send in those suggestions. Podcast yeah. at jerryanderson.co.uk. Ah. I saw that love that sigh you gave there. Ah. Over to Richard. Uh. I'm yeah. oh, just a bit Great. tired, sorry, no, sorry. Right, so on. on the Twitter sphere, people have been getting in touch all week and hashtagging us Jerry Anderson Podcast so we can see their tweets, and I have assembled the top five. Here we go. Five. Simon tweeted another great Jerry Anderson podcast. Great to hear a different side to Benji Clifford. Four. This one's from Melvin, who said the terrifically cult American channel Watch Comet has been showing a Thunderbirds marathon all day today, and I've been spreading the podcast love on their Facebook posts. Thank Thanks, you for Melvin. That, Melvin. Three. Third, it's from Shane, who says, just subscribe to the podcast. Cheers for the heads up. That's what we like to hear. Two. Secondly, we have Barbara, who said, I just heard Robson Green and co singing Aquamarina in Soldier Soldier on the Drama Channel in a scene where they were walking through a lake. One of the squaddies got likened to Marina. One. And finally, Craig Walker says, hello, chaps. You may remember my daughter Ellie in her Thunderbirds baby clothes, coining the hashtag, Hashtag fab parenting. Well, we've been watching a bit more Thunderbirds here and there, and the countdown has really made an impression on her. She now walks around the house saying, five, four, three, two, one, Thunderbirds are go, and regularly asks, Thunderbirds now, Daddy, meaning it's time to watch some. With the nice weather, I also got her a blow up Thunderbird 2 paddling pool for the garden, which she loves. Nice. Isn't it? More yep. fab parenting. If you've got a hashtag fab parenting story, would you yes. like to share with us? Email in, tweet us. Yes. Hashtag Jerry Anderson Podcast, whatever you like. Just well, uh, we'll see it. get us evidence of said story and we may Absolutely. well share it on the podcast or elsewhere. Yeah, that's great. So thank you for that, Craig. And uh, yeah, do follow him on Twitter and you can see some uh, video of, uh, of the lovely Ellie with her Thunderbirds countdown. Sweet. Very sweet. Yeah. Uh, now, Richard. Yes. We're holding up the inevitable and also well, people's favourite part of the podcast. I think you're right, yes. So, uh, I mean, is, is it time for the randomizer? do you think? Well, if he's around, is he? Where is he anyway? I Should be here. Should be yours. Oh, Hang on, I'll see if I can get hold of him. Okay. 
Will someone answer that for me? Zitello. Hello. Uh, hello. Uh, is Chris there, please? He is taking a shower. Right. Okay. Um, it's just that we're about ready for the randomizer now, so uh, could you tell him we need it as soon as possible, please? We. Oui, I will tell him as soon as his body has been dried and polished. Okay. Thanks. Uh, wait. What? <laughs> Oh, dear, dear me, how tiresome. Don't those two understand that my genius can't be rushed? It takes an eternity to find my motivation every week to bring out my inner buffoon and deliver unto my legion of fans the high-quality nonsense that they crave. Oh, dear weak, dear boy. Are you ready to press the button? Of course. You think I'm standing here like this unready? Sit alone. Then by all means, my... Dear fellow, please proceed. Think buffoon. Think buffoon. <laughs> yep, falling out of the shower, just the trick. Oh, what is happening? It's all right, Dizwe, no need to panic. Oh, you know what that noise means, don't you? I have not got a clue. Ah, right. Well, it means we've landed on an episode from a two-part story. So, we'll watch part one this week and part two next week. I think that'll work out well. And this particular two-parter is quite an interesting one, because it very nearly wasn't a two-parter at all. We'll get more into that as we give Space Precinct a death watch. <coughs> what? Oh, yes, um, uh, right after I put some clothes on, in fact. Um... Thank you, Dizweet. Talk about the eye-opening. So, it's been a while since we've seen Space Precinct on the old randomizer. Um, I'm sure this is going to make Richard James very happy. And I think we've done three so far. And mostly, so far, we've been pulling them from the, the very end of the series, the better episodes. And today is no exception. We've gone... Well, with this episode, we've gone almost right to the end, because uh, although this is the beginning of the two-part series finale, this was not um, not the last or indeed even the penultimate episode of the series to be filmed. We'll get more into that later. But uh, yeah, this is the beginnings of where Space Precinct finally ended. And straight away, we are just hooked with one of the most interesting images of the entire series. Uh, the CGI is a bit sort of... It, it, it was possible at the time, but today it's not uh, the greatest. And just this rip in space, and you see this other universe beyond, and this meteor just comes spilling out. What's that about? We don't know. But now we're going over to this uh, uh, military research base where we find one Wayne Forrester. Surprise, surprise. Actually, How are we doing? surprise in Can this episode, considering the number of appearances Wayne made in the series, and considering... How whenever he appeared, he always had his own voice. This is, I think, the one time in the series he appears with his own face. Eastern edge of the bay and the ocean beyond. And is dubbed. Most of it'll burn up in the atmosphere. I don't care. I can't afford to take any chances. Understood. So this is Captain Weldon yes, and... Heaven help us if we lose it. Major Graffer. And I've always wondered if this shot of Weldon looking towards... There's a massive blue screen behind her, which I can only guess is an unfinished or unachievable kind of effect shot. I imagine this is supposed to be like a Star Trek style display on there, but instead they've just left the blue screen. Um, maybe it's meant to look like that, but I can't imagine that's the case because they should be looking out over sort of the snowy mountains where the base is set. Hans, her and me are in love. Well, in that case, there's only one thing I can say. Oh? You fool. Oh, no, that's, that's, my, that's my, my, my cynic coming in, but, uh, ooh. Looks like you got yourself some fireworks to celebrate the occasion. Huh? Yeah, very pretty. This is the meteor raining down on uh, the farm belonging to one Randall Butler and his um, farmhand, uh, Skiles, is the, the guy driving the truck. Let's go take a look. Yeah. And I like that, you know, this series is obviously so focused in Futuristic city, futuristic city, space stations and such. And this is one of the few times where we see just, like, ordinary 
well, farm people. It's um, it, it's not necessarily what you'd expect to see in a a sci-fi series, especially an Anderson series. And I think again, it highlights the the way that this one sort of it brings up sort of different ideas the series hadn't played with before, including this meteor. Mr. Butler, Mr. Butler is going to touch. Never a good thing. I mean, it's not glowing green, but even so, deadly enough by the look of it. Oh, jeez. I always found that a very odd, odd thing for an alien to say. Oh, jeez. I assume that's an abbreviation of Jesus. Is he? Is he Christian? This uh, alien chap. Are you sure you're okay? Well, if he. Uh, does believe in any god. Let's just say um, his god is not with him in this scene because Mr. Butler has now stood up and his eyes have turned purple. Jeez, what is that thing? And Butler just... Oh, that's it. Shovel over the head. And I... Well, I presume decapitation as well. Very swift and brutal death for Skiles. Poor Skiles. I chance to... It's good and healthy. So again, we've gone from high-tech military base to um, the sort of mundane world of a farm, and now we're in the equally mundane world of uh, a run-down tower block. One day you got neighbours, the next, lizards. Well, I'm not going anywhere. With these two, uh, two sweet old ladies, one Creon, one... Um, Here, for you. I don't think her, her race is identified. Um... They're the only two tenants left in this building. Man's inhumanity to man. Now, something I should probably mention with this, which might help make it... Me neither. Partly make sense, but also um, make it a bit more confusing. Um, so most broadcasts and uh, DVD sets will place... He made me another ...Death Watch and Death Watch Conclusion as the, the series finale. That was not... The plan. Um, it's a lot of money, Bertha. The plan was. Oh, I know. We'd make Death Watch, right. and um, then they didn't make the conclusion yeah. until okay. I think three episodes later, because originally there was no conclusion. This was just going to be a standalone episode, which, um, again, I'll get into more later. It's kind of Ooh, baffling to me that they ever thought the that what this you, didn't deserve. Suicide to be continued, but also there's a Jack and Jane subplot in this one where he's he's sort of worried that she's she's got another admirer and it does link in rather nicely to how they're eventually how their relationship eventually develops in the final episode. So this is scattered with a lot of moments like that where it wasn't planned to be followed up on, but then they did follow it up and it kind of it kind of fits. Uh, let's find out. And yet, equally, there are there are moments where part one and part two have elements that just just don't gel at all. Top floor. Over there, Fredo. It's a very as a two part of this is a very baffling. It's it's good. It's a very baffling viewing experience at times. Look, there's no way I can set her down. So one of the old ladies has been chased up to the roof of the tower block by two tarn uh, thugs. She's getting close. And Haldane is just gonna. Haldane is so cool. And I really like in this episode, he's just like, I'm going to look after this old lady. She is, she's my new best friend. And I'm going to prove that by jumping out of the cruiser onto the roof. Way back up from the street. Break a leg. Right. This guy is just, well, his stuntman is very cool. You all right? Oh, don't you stand there. Go get him. All right, yes, ma'am. Stay put. <laughs> and I love how this old lady, uh, Mrs. Fluss, Bertha Fluss, she's like... Yeah, she may be physically old and slightly infirm, but she, her mind is still totally sharp, and she's like, yeah, you go, you go sort out the bad guys. This is what I pay taxes for you to do. I thought I told you to wait inside. I thought she might need some help. <laughs> See, that's exactly what I mean. She thinks she can, she thinks she'll be of use to the, uh, the armed police officer. But luckily, as it turns out, they don't need help. Uh, nothing my way, thank you. Use the There's only one way to handle a woman. You gotta stand up and tell her how you feel. Be forceful. Be direct. To my mom. What are you, a Creon or a whip? I love this stuff of Oren. Oren struggles with his mom that's mentioned a couple of times in this episode. What? 
Bertha Fluss, the beast of astronomics 101. And also that Mrs. Fluss is... Um, one of your high school teachers? Yeah, one of Remick's old teachers. Because, again, it's like it's a little insight into the past histories of these characters that we very rarely got any glimpses of in this show. Is that all they teach you at medical school these days? Nice meeting you, Mrs. Fluss. Carson didn't go to medical school. Carson yeah. went to just... Knowing about everything in all aspects of anything vaguely related with science school. Is that you? Plot convenience school, that's the one. Oh, yeah! I'm looking at the reactions on, on Romek's face there, the animatronics by this point are just so, so expressive. I don't know if maybe Romek benefited from being a mask that was made... Oh, we do let him out every once ...after... Come on, Mrs. Floss, let's see if we can get him out. ...the very early... The very earliest masks. He didn't appear until episode five onwards. Maybe they learnt some lessons there that sort of enabled them to put more expression into his face. He always, he's a master of sort of like vacant looks. What are we supposed to do? There must be something you can do. People don't just disappear. Well, it's a free planet. I feel for this. So Skiles' girlfriend has come to the station house to report him missing. Skiles got cold feet. Um, you think I'm making this whole thing up? And I no. think she's probably one what of the most the is trying to say is that unless we have evidence of foul sympathetic play, characters we ever see in the series, just because she's only in two scenes. Great. Thanks a lot for your help. Thanks. And this one took and Castle are like, well, he's probably just he's probably oh, fed up with you. And you should just get over it, essentially. Um, she does reappear later and again gets treated just as badly. Um it's, it's an uncharacteristically sort of unsympathetic moment from Castle and Took there, I feel. I should have given the sketch artist a better picture. Sorry, now we have another street scene at uh, well, Indemnitor City. Office. And again, the, the street scenes trying in trying this, I think I said back in Deadline, were... They started out quite badly. This one, the tower looks so great from the outside. There are, like, shops in the background now. Um, it's still not 100% there, but it's so much improved over what it was before. Oh, you can say that again. It's so much improved over what it was before. Gentlemen, this is my landlord, Randall Borden. Ooh. Lieutenant Brogan and... He's suspiciously like, uh, old Randall Butler there. Mrs. Luton just told me what happened. It must have been terrible. Are you all right? His bright purple eyes and... Yeah, I, I, I really like what... Um, oh, I've forgotten the actor's name who's playing Borden Butler in this. He's really good in this. Because he's got the... You know, he seemed like a good guy before he was taken over. Then he's got the sinister air of being possessed by this evil alien force, but also he's this... You see the difference. He's chosen to adopt this sort of slimy, uh, very sort of... Oh, that's creepy so landlord type guy with even down to the greasy hair it's, it's a great image form that's the key i'm not entirely sure about these two tarn uh, thugs though the um if i'd been a few years younger sort of like brief philosophical discussions they they have i think they're trying to make it feel like something out of i've added a little potassium i don't know they're, they're, i guess they're trying to go for the contrast the extreme violence and the sort of extreme philosophy stuff kind of like i don't know i think it's meant to be some like something out of a clockwork orange but it doesn't quite companionship is my function come on nice crib you got here lady but they've broken into bertha's home Whatever well i say want. broken in the, the door apparently wasn't locked Just take it. Um, and leave me alone. One of them is oh, no, holding his crotch, that, almost like he needs the bathroom. <laughs> oh, you missed one. <laughs> one that one didn't smash; it just bounced. Rocky Collar, of course. And that's oh, poor little Rocky the robot has just been decapitated with a broom. Uh, I don't know why he's called Rocky when the name on his side is, is Boris, or it might be Bore One Five. Uh, I, I I do like Rocky, Rocky the robot in this. He's only in a couple of scenes, um, but it, it, again, it adds to the world building of this because up until now, the only robot we've seen has been slow mo. Um, occasionally, you would have like an artificial intelligence, like in the lift in Body and Soul. But it helps to add to this world when we see, like, robots are, you know, in this episode, being used as companions for the elderly. 
which makes absolute perfect sense. That is a, a great way to use them, to make these little creatures that are so, you know, so helpful and cheerful, and they are companions for, for the for people who, who have no one else. So I like that. I like that bit of world building with this. They're on their way. Anyway, it doesn't matter now because Rocky's been decapitated and the thugs have locked Bertha in a storage closet. But luckily, Haldane is going to to find her and let her out. Not because anyone reported her missing. Bertha? But because he just decided to show up with flowers. Because he's just a good guy, is Haldane. Bertha! I know, I know. Again, some people don't Bertha. don't like him. I can't. I can't I'm see it. He's just... In here. For the most part, he's just this all-round good guy. Is that you? Are you in there? So, we have a bit of a mystery here because the two military officers, uh, Weldon and Graffer, have been parked outside in a van watching. And now... This place was a mess! Bertha's apartment has been miraculously put back as it was before the attack. They killed my Rocky! My Roka! There you are, Bertha. And this Whatever is something that I can't quite... Um, <laughs> believe. So Weldon and Graffer have somehow facilitated this miraculous restoration of her apartment to its original You never returned. Its original pre-trashing form right down to rebuilding Rocky. How did they do this? I know they say that they, they sent in a team or something, but I, uh, I don't know. How would they make everything? I mean, how did they repair all the plates in time? How did they get Rocky back to normal? Did they... Look, I will admit, something very weird is going on around yeah. You're telling me. Did they, like, scan her apartment, make a list of everything that was in there before it got trashed? Uh, look, Mrs. Floss... It's probably the one part of this story that I can't quite believe, and this is a story about a, a, an alien meteor from another dimension coming to to Altor and possessing people. What do you want to do? This is the bit that's quite strange. Protection. This is for me, officer. Yeah. And I have a name. It's Jack. This is so sweet, because again, we... Most of the women we see Haldane interacting with You've through this series. Me, Come on, Captain, an attempt was made on her life. Are all, you know, you young and pretty, you know. Most of his interactions with women are no. of a sort of flirty she nature. Has a reason to lie, and in this episode, he's like, hey, this old woman, she's my new best friend, and I am going to uh, not only check up on her. Mrs. Flass doesn't seem like the hysterical type. I am going to actually fight what, what for this? her and make sure that she's, you know, you she's protected. Contact social services. Captain, wait. Something is definitely happening down there. And it's, it, it's, a, it's a new angle for the character, but also it, it absolutely fits. I don't see him as sort of like, you know, just a would-be womanizer. He's more a sort of... But... All right, Dando, and thank you for your help. He's a gentleman, essentially. <laughs> he just wants to make sure that all women are, are looked after and treated well. Well, suppose he did get cold feet. He wouldn't disappear completely. And there's an extra in the cages behind Castle and Took here who I think is a, he's wearing the Clyburn woman's head from Deadline, wearing glasses, and he's got a strange goatee and a bit of hair on the top of his head. He looks very strange. On this new landlord, all right? Oh, right, so you are bopping the beast. Oh. Now, why don't you shut up, Romick? Or maybe you'd like me to shut you up. Well, you want a piece of me? Yeah! Hey, 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 hey. I, I like that bit. I really like that bit. It's kind of... It's just a joke. Yeah. It's kind of a stretch to get to that moment, but I do like it when these characters are yelling at each other. So Jane and Took are now hovering over Butler's farm. They can see the meteor glowing in a little tent down there, and they've just been overtaken by a couple of uh, military jets. You have entered restricted military airspace. Change your heading to zero Very formidable. and exit this fly zone. <sighs> I've still got the little uh, teddy bear on the dashboard. That's so sweet. What the military choose to do is, quite frankly, none of our business. I want to know. No, what I find Podley's behaviour through actually both episodes of this two-parter so rather uncharacteristic for him. Being on our tour. I imagine you officers are familiar with illegal aliens. Because it now, seems like every time somebody comes to him in this episode saying, "Oh, there's a bit of a mystery going on here," he's like, "Well, shut up, stop it. There's no mystery. And there's nothing unexplained." that every officer in my staff is out there doing social work. This is all fine. Stop it. I, I don't... Sir. He's... 
What connection? Between he never normally seems this dim. I know he's oh, meant to be sort of... sake, you have no hard evidence of a crime. Leave it to missing persons, all right? I, I know he's supposed to be like, you know, the crusty commander, as we see in a lot of other Jerry Anderson shows, but in this episode, he just seems like a buzzkill who can't really catch a clue. And in both cases, you know, Tooken Castle and Brogan and Haldane, they're both onto something, ultimately. But he's like, no, 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 forget it. It's too much work. I just came by to see. Oh, you again. Know. Um, so um, Damn Weldon cuts. and um, Graffer are still monitoring what's going on in the apartment building. I notice that they too keep an eye on have boy. calculators on their on their dashboard. Um, calculators meant to be like um, little computer consoles, much like we saw in um, a Space Tank over in Terror Hawks. That's so sweet. Meanwhile, what is not sweet, oh, Borden and the Tarn boys again. have come back to okay. pester Mrs. Newton. Have you reconsidered yet? I'm not interested. This is my home. I'm sorry to hear that. You see, you leave me no choice. I have to persuade you. Oh, no, right. get out. And it's time to throw the old lady off the roof. Um, you can't let this go. Ironically, while there is a police officer in the building, because Haldane is back with Bertha, having a nice little chat over over coffee. If you want to be happy, you have to face your fears. Like here, where Mrs. Newton is facing her fear of heights by uh, that just great. They're spectacular. being shown the view from the top of the apartment block. It's, it's quite an odd... Um, contrast. Terrorising an old lady, cut back to scenes of having a nice cosy chat with an old lady. And she's been thrown off the roof and I, yeah, the, um, that shot of her falling is rather, she doesn't seem to be falling fast enough. She's, she's, um, overlaid onto a model shot, but I don't think she's quite falling fast enough. And there may also be a, a size issue there. Um, but yeah, Props to them for trying, at least. I'm talking about the fact that we feel there's a connection between this incident and the systematic harassment of tenants in your building. Frankly, I'm shocked that you should make such a suggestion at a time like this. Well, now we're down to, uh, to tenant hey, singular. Sir, there's only Bertha no, left Mr. now. Mr. Borden, we'll let you know if we need anything. All right, okay. What'd you find out in the background check? Borden strictly legit. Hey, the the, right the, month, the guy from the cell earlier that I mentioned with the Clyburn head, the he's standing behind the police barrier now. He filed a demolition permit with City Hall, but he's not made bail on him then. Anything in its place. Come on, you move it. Hey! And here we go, Orin and Romek have caught the two thugs. I'm at the shuttle gate, interplanetary, tickets in hand. Two minutes later, and they'd have been nothing more than a memory. And I like that they, you know, as much as they are often the, the comic relief, they can actually get things done. Hungry. Guess this means you get home in time for your mommy's curfew. Very funny. While also making uh, snipey comments at each other. However, the Tarns are not going to be in custody long because Graffer and Weldon coming down the stairs from Potley's office. As far as you're concerned, these two are never arrested and this never happened. Talk to your captain if you want. I'll do that. This isn't over. It's over, Brogan. What? We catch the <laughs> don't understand Podley in this episode at all. It's like... Oh, I handed them over to the military. Just, is he having a I don't like this anymore midlife crisis or something? He suddenly decided just to... Not, but not be a police officer. Not be the same guy that he's been for the last... 20 odd episodes. There's nothing I can do. I'm sorry, gentlemen. I'm just a police captain. It's not up to me. Leave me alone. Were yesterday on that military plane? Oh. <laughs> well, you tell you us. Th th I think, yeah, Podley is. We'll Podley's presentation in this episode, and again, well, slightly in the second, is probably a weak spot. Yeah, they're both the same. You know what? We're working on the same case here. Oh, I love that bit. I wish more was. This is definitely not over. Was made yet. of that because again, once they realise that they're both working on the same case, it becomes just Brogan and Haldane's castle and took a, a gone for the rest of the episode essentially. And underneath the apartment building, Roteam Towers, we have a glowing sinister pink meteorite thingy and a pair of glowing sinister pink eyes. As Mr. Borden, uh, oh, he's um, pouring. Cyclo something all up the stairs. Gonna have a barbecue. He's torching the place. Can you believe this? <laughs> I can believe anything. Really? Have you seen a man eat his own head? 
But what about the old lady? She's still up there in her apartment. Collateral damage. We can't interfere with Butler. He's all we've got. So Greffer and Weldon are quite happy to let uh, oh, no. the building burn Goodness down with here. Bertha still inside it. Unfortunately, these damn pesky police officers have appeared to do the right thing again. Oh, so tedious. We're checking on a private citizen, then we're out of here. Hmm. Too late for that, I'm afraid. Go home, officers. You don't need to know anymore. Uh, the hell I don't. Let him go. It won't make any difference. I do like um, Greff and Weldon in this. I... I... Although I don't think it's it's the strongest performance in the world, I like that Weldon is... She has at least got a degree of empathy. You know, it doesn't matter to her whether Bertha is saved one way or another, but if she could be saved, that would be handy. Whereas Graffer is like, I don't care. I just, it's... We've got to see how this plays out. We've got to let things take their course. And he looks really... Impassive and, and slightly sinister as well, with that neat little moustache and the, the eye patch as well. Um... In this episode, I... He's quite a sort of static figure, really. You, you rarely see him moving. The building is now going up in flames. It looks like uh, the fire started on the basement staircase. And now, while Brogan is trying to put it out, Borden jumps him, having a bit of a scuffle, while Haldane is helping Bertha down the stairs. And unfortunately, this means that Poor old Rocky or Boris the robot or whoever he is. It's been left to die in the fire once again. Oh, and speaking of dying in fire, Borden has now fallen down the staircase. Having a bit of a tantrum on the way down while his eyes are glowing purple. Give me a hand, Brogan. This all looks very dangerous. I know, I'm, I'm sure there would have been like fire fire officers on set during all this, but the actors are very close to this fire. And here we get some nice... Oh, this, actually, this shot is not nice. Come on! <laughs> Graf is sort of lightly jogging away from the danger. Uh, there's some, some lovely model work of the building going up in flames and exploding. It's all right, Bertha. But the compositing in that one shot is... Um, is pretty bad. Uh, it's not the worst because we haven't got to the final scene of the episode yet. Butler's dead, you just had to interfere. Oh, and our plan of sitting around doing nothing, waiting for him to burn the building down was going so well. Humor me, Weldon. And that Ted Shackelford is really good when Brogan has to be Is there something under the building? Something angry. But he's also good. Oh, great. And it happened only a few times in this series where it was like, oh, here's an unknowable mystery. <gasps> What's going on? <gasps> oh, spooky. Um, I can't really explain it any better than that, I don't think. But he's sort of, he's really good at sort of... We have to stop it. ...pushing the there's a mystery element to this. Good news, buddy. I found a place for you to live. My neighbor's moving out. I don't need a place. I live with my mom. Well, this is the thrilling conclusion freedom, to the Orin you, has problems with his mum story. Why would my mom do without me? I mean, who would clean the compactor? What's your dad's for, Orin? <laughs> right. Hey, uh, Haldane. And this is the... Um, uh, what I wanted to say was, uh, firstly, I like that Romek and Haldane have this little Maybe apology moment. But this is the other appearance of Scouse's girlfriend. Hmm, you know, who is just seen essentially funny. crying in the background. She meant everything she Because, said you know, you. the death of her yeah. fiancé, it's a minor point compared hey. to um, Orin and... Orin and his mum and other things. It's like, oh god, this poor woman, she's just literally pushed into the background. Like in that shot, Took is dealing with her and she's she looks away from Anza to eavesdrop on the Haldane and Jane talk. It's like, oh god, this poor woman. I want you to know that I only give you a hard time because I, you know, I care about you. I care about you too. Really. So who's Peter? He's my brother. <laughs> Your brother? Your brother? Yes. <laughs> um, what brother and sister relationship is constantly sending each other flowers and chocolates? Hardly. Unless it's a birthday or a special occasion. I d oh, there's Anza being carried away, uh, led away in the background. Get out of here, woman, you and your... Your 
heartbreak is is none of our business anymore. Get the next shuttle back to Demeter. Yes, Lieutenant Brogan, DCPD. Let me speak to Captain Weldon. Negative. I have and what's clever about this is this woman who's saying there's no Captain Weldon, there's nobody here of that name. She was in she was in the very background in the opening scene at the um, military base. So that's presumably the same room as they were watching the meteorite come down in. She knows there's a Captain Weldon. She works with her. She's fibbing. Oh dear. And now we cut back to the ruins of the tower block. And this is, I said the, there was a shot, a really badly composited shot in this episode. This is it. The model shot of the meteor being pulled out of the ruins is, is beautiful. But there's an insert shot of Graffer and Weldon watching from on a hill. And they're so badly composited into the background of the city that they almost look like giants. It, it's a shot that really doesn't work. Anyway, the meteor from under the tower has now been pulled up, placed in a sealed container, and we have our to be continued. And incredibly, that was where they were going to leave it. Because they, they were going to leave it completely open-ended. And uh, I guess they felt no one would be interested in finding out what happened after that. It's like, it's like um, that episode of Next Generation where Picard is assimilated by the Borg. If they just said next week, um, you know what, actually, we're not interested in following that up. You know, he, he, he got better. He walked it off. It's fine. It blows my mind that that was, that was considered a satisfactory ending. I, I kind of get the appeal of leaving it open-ended, but... <sighs> So this is a fairly baffling one to judge because you have to judge it as part one of a two-parter, but also it wasn't produced with that in mind. So on its own, it's it's a decent enough episode. Uh, and I always wonder how I would feel if there wasn't a part two, but there is a part two, and we'll see that next week. GTV. I mean, who doesn't like a bit of Space Precinct? Well... <laughs> Well, okay. I, How long have you got? I've got a list here. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Death Watch, that's an interesting one. That was, um, as Chris alluded to there, that was meant to be just a single uh, one episode. Mm. We came back to it several weeks later, towards the end. Uh, I think it probably was the last one we, we shot was episode two. Suddenly we got this script through the post saying Death Watch part two. A? Eh? Oh, I see. You mean that was part one, was it? Because you, you all thought that was just one, that yeah. was just a standalone. Yeah. Even though absolutely. it's got that weird kind of yeah. cliffhangery type mystery. Yeah. I think it was to meant it. to be some kind of, you know, ambiguous sort of, uh, yeah. But then they went went back to it. But also, uh, interesting for the for the dialogue as well. I remember particularly in part one, mm. a couple of uh, aliens who um, it's quite violent. They, don't they? Uh, Bertha, Bertha Fluss, I think, was an alien character who gets um, knocked about a bit, and uh, lots of uh, kind of uh, Tarantino esque dialogue between the two aliens. I remember. Yeah. So an example really of the series as it did occasionally trying to flex its swings a little bit and try something different. Yeah. Whether it was uh, you know successful or not, I leave it to the viewer. But um, yeah, interesting. Let us know what you think, folks. And if you're coming to Space Precinct for the first time just because of the randomizer, we'd mm. love to know. Mm. Um, it, the full series is available on DVD. Yes, it is. In the Jerry Anderson store. As That's well right. as the soundtrack, if you like the soundtrack. Yeah. And if you are coming to it for the first time, do look out for a certain lanky, hairy Creon. <laughs> I thought Beazle was gone by this point. Oi, I said hairy. Actually, I got more progressively hairy as the series went along because they suddenly added hair one day, didn't they? Yeah. Very strange, yes. Oh, well, didn't must really think it through. Using regain, uh, well, ro rogain, bro that's ex brogain. No, that's exactly sorry. what they did a little later on mm. in, a, in a future episode. They kind of retconned. Oh, yes, and, the uh, hair, hair restorer. Yeah, that's right. I'd forgotten about that. So there oh, you go. Funny. Attention to detail. Brilliant. Thanks, Chris. So that was lovely. Another amazing randomizer coming our way next week, of course, in pod 57. Well, we know what it'll be. be. No, we know it'll be because oh, the, the rules of the randomizer are if he lands ah, on a part one or a part two, I he see. does part one and two. So next week, the randomizer is not random. No, I it's see. It's a fixed-a-miser. Yes. And uh, it's Death Watch part two. <laughs> so you can Great. record that in Pod 57. Yeah. yeah. And well, that gives you a week then, doesn't it? As we know what's coming, sit down and watch the episode if you've got it. Yeah. Uh, and then listen to Chris next week and see if you agree. Perfect. Yeah, lovely. Can't often say that, can we? Very good. Well, that's the end then, Richard. I think it is. I think that's yeah. it. I think we've gone and done it. We have. Only gone and done it. Uh, listeners, if you've enjoyed this, please go and review us. Just give us a rating on whatever your uh, podcast listening platform of choice is. ID the yeah. iTunes, uh, or whatever yeah. it's called now, Apple Podcasts. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Apple something or other. But yeah, give us a review on there. Only take you five seconds, um, preferably five star. Maybe yeah, well, well, will be okay. Well, yes, four will be right. Yeah. Yeah. yeah happy but, with that. Yeah, uh, and it, it really does make a difference because people find us more easily when we're better reviewed. So thank yeah. you for that in advance. Yeah. 
Make sure you're subscribed. Send us your questions, thoughts, queries, uh, admonishments to podcast at jerryanson.co.uk. <laughs> and we... Admonishments for what? <laughs> Probably getting something wrong. Yeah, um, well, we've certainly done that at some point. Rubbish yeah, fab facts. Yeah. So don't forget, we want to see your uh, your picture of your uh, of your new Funko Pops if you're buying them, uh, mm. posed in a uh, suitably adventurous pose. Uh, send them in, tweet them, uh, hashtag us Jerry Anson Podcast, and we'll see them there as well. We'll talk yeah. about them next time. Yeah, we look forward to that. Yeah. Uh, uh, and we also look forward to being in your ears next week in Pod 7 of the Jerry Anson Podcast. Thank you for listening. See you then. Goodbye. Bye. Stage one complete. Let's go. Yes, you did very well. How, are you holding up all right? No. Nope. <laughs> have you got uh, Have you got any more energy for a sort of you know witty outro banter or anything? Not really. No, I've got to go and pick up Ernie from the vets. Oh so, yes, so you my have. Poor little doggy. Oh, yeah. so what is the news? It's, 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 going to, it's going to be all right, isn't it? Yeah, it's yeah. Just, uh... It's a very nasty wound he got. We don't know how he did it, but he's it's, he's all stitched up and he's he's got Ooh. to come home and rest for a little while. He'll be sore, good. won't he? Uh, he will be, yeah, and he's twelve as well. So ah, yeah. you know, it's not too yeah. bad for a Jack Russell, but you yeah. know, he's he's you know, it would be like a sort of. Someone in their fifties or sixties getting a, a nasty injury, I think. So. Well, yeah. What would be wrong with that? What do you mean, someone in their fifties? Nothing. Just that they might take injury. a bit longer well, to. Hang on, what do you mean by that? What are you saying? Fifties. Hey, I've got to go to the vets now, oh, so I'll oh. see you later. Thanks. Bye. Bye. bye.